So here's a problem, let's move on to the solution. So we're being told that there is a charge density of k over r squared within this region. So you can imagine this being cross-sectional of that sphere, this being a, this being b, and we're going to have some, have some charge here that follows this distribution. So we're told to find the electric field. So first let's consider the electric field when r is smaller than a. So obviously we can use Shell's theorem to argue about this, and we can see that the electric field is always equal to zero because essentially we have a giant shell, and inside the shell, due to Shell's theorem, the Shell theorem, we know that the electric field inside is always going to be zero. So essentially there we have it uh, for r smaller than a. So let's consider the next case where r is between a and b. So here we're going to have to turn to Gauss's law. So since we see that the within this region over here, the charge density is somewhat symmetrical. It only varies mm -hmm. according to R. So we know that the electric field is always going to be orthogonal to whatever sphere we might draw around this area. So we can, uh, from this line, we can jump to this line. So the absolute value of the electric field is going to be, uh, so this surface integral is going to be the absolute value of the electric field times the surface area of whatever sphere we wrap around that region. And that's going to be equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon. So what is the enclosed charge going to be? So once again, this is standard procedure. We just integrate the charge density times times a unit volume, and then we integrate it over the bounds. So we know that the charge density from 0 to a is going to be equal to 0 for r smaller than a. So essentially we can change this bound to be a to r instead of 0 to r, because from 0 to a it's going to be equal to 0. And then from a to r, the charge density is going to be equal to k over r squared. So moving on, so first of all let's get rid of the 2 pi's. So for the phi terms we can just get a 2 pi because there are no other phi terms inside the integral. For 0 to pi, we have a sine theta, and if you work that out, that's going to be equal to 2. So we're going to be left with a to r, k over r squared times r squared dr. These cancel out, and then obviously, you get a 4 pi k r minus a. And so, moving back to our original question, we can find the electric field. So that is going to be equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon divided by the surface area. Obviously the four pi's cancel out, so we arrive at something like this. So it's a constant times r minus a divided by r squared. And don't forget, so let's, let me just get rid of the absolute value sign. So here, this is going to be a vector. So this is the answer for this region over here. So let's move on to the third case, where r is larger than b. So once again, we can move to Gauss's law. And again, with the same symmetrical argument, we can argue that we can jump from the first line to this line. So times whatever surface we wrap around the region. And the enclosed charge q, we can actually calculate with this. The way we do it is that we change the bound to b, because uh, Again, the bounds go from 0 to r, but from 0 to a, it's going to be equal to 0. From a to b, it's going to be equal to this. Uh, it's going to be equal to this. And then from b all, all the way to r, because in our case, r is going to be larger than b. From b to r is again going to be equal to 0, because we're outside the sphere already. So the enclosed charge in this case is just going to be this integral evaluated, evaluated from a to b. So using this result that we have, we can see that the enclosed charge is actually just 4 pi k b minus a. So that's straightforward enough. So we can just apply this result over here. So 4 pi k b minus a. And once again, we divide the, the surface area to the other side. And so we get something like this, k over epsilon b minus a divided by r squared. So this is going to be the electric field. 
So let's summarize. So for, R, for, for case 1, when r is smaller than a, the electric field is going to be equal to 0. The second case, where r is between a and b, the electric field is going to be equal to k over epsilon r minus a divided by r squared. For the third case, where r is larger than b, the electric field is going to be equal to k over epsilon b minus a r squared. So if you were to graph this, you'll see how the electric field is going to change. So let this be r, let this be the absolute value of the electric field. So let's mark our axis. So this is a, this is b. So from 0 to a, it's going to be equal to 0. And then starting from a, it's going to slowly rise. So observe this function. When r is equal to a, it's going to be equal to 0. And then it's going to definitely increase to a value larger than larger than a 0. So it's going to be a positive number. So naturally, we can assume that's going to grow in this kind of shape. And up to here, you see that b minus a is actually just a constant. So we have a function that is proportional to 1 over r squared. And 1 over r squared is going to look something like this. So we're going to cut off this left-hand side and just want the side of, uh, with the, that's larger than b. So using that, we see that the absolute value of the electric field is going to slope downwards like this. So there you have it. This is what it might look like if we graph this, uh, if we graph the absolute value of the electric field.